Good morning and good afternoon. Thanks so much for joining our stream and welcome to Beer Trends Around the Globe. My name is Gemma. I am the Business Development Manager for the Cicerone Certification Program and I will be your host today. I am here with a great selection of panelists that are in different countries right now and will be uh, piercing through time zones uh, to share a little bit about what they are doing uh, in each of these countries, what kind of beers they are making, what kind of beers they're importing and what can you find. And just uh, learning about like if they have specific regulations, uh, for instance, that have uh, shaped the, the beer around them. Uh, I'm, I'm from Costa Rica and I'll be sharing some uh, facts about Costa Rica as well as we go along. Uh, but right now I want to uh, introduce our first panelist. Um, so I want to introduce Anudeep, uh, who's in India. And by the way, it's 7 a.m. here, so we'll, we'll ask everybody what, what time it is in their countries. And Udib is an advanced Cicerone certified BJCP judge and a beer educator from India. Uh, he hosts sensory panels, beer and food pairing events, and trains beer brewery staff to help them improve um, their verbal and visual communication around beer. Also participated on Beer Savages, a podcast to simplify beer uh, to people uh, around the world. So. Let, let's uh, see Anudeep here. Oh, we have everybody. Anudeep, are you around? Oh, perfect. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me and thanks for tuning in. I'm looking forward for this discussion. Awesome. And Anudeep, oh, so what time is it over there? 6.30 p.m. Awesome, awesome. So good, good evening. <laughs> and tell me a little bit more about yourself and your experience in beer, and also what what's beer in India like right now? Yeah, um, a little bit about myself. I was a mechanical engineer, uh, and I shifted my career into beer uh, back in 2016. I got into home brewing, started judging in some of the local uh, home brew competitions uh, for BJCP. And uh, that's when I came across Cicerone certification program, and I did my levels. Uh, and I'm a, I'm an advanced Cicerone now. And uh, I so this was when I stayed in the U.S. Uh, I was doing my master's in mechanical, and I came back in 2019 and uh, uh, started working for a brewery as a as a beer ambassador. And uh, I worked in technical sales for a little bit for a raw material supplier company. Uh, and I uh, started consulting uh, microbreweries uh, with beer education, uh, specifically offering uh, uh, different courses uh, around sensory panels uh, and uh, just training their staff to simplify the beer communication with their audience. Um, and also, I, am, I share most of my learnings uh, in so, some of the India-based uh, Facebook beer groups. Uh, so we have a lot of uh, audience there. Um, so that's like a great platform for me to uh, educate uh, people. So, uh, yeah, I, I just recently got my advanced drone uh, a few months ago. Uh, for Congratulations. Which I to the US. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, that's, my, uh, that's my beer journey. Uh, and in terms of uh, beer in India, um, we have like most of the consumers are still uh, the commercial lager drinkers, like that's 99% of the beer drinking audience. Uh, but if you're looking at microbreweries, uh, like right now we have around 250 microbreweries uh, in, in the entire country. So you're uh, thinking of maybe 250 breweries for almost 2 billion people, which is definitely not enough. <laughs> uh, but so there's definitely like a boom in craft beer, uh, Specifically, that's happening from the last four or five years. Uh, cool. And uh, and uh, yeah, so uh, I, I live in Bangalore, which is uh, in the southern part of India. It's a, it's in a state called Karnataka. So there are like sixty-five to seventy microbreweries here right now. Um, so yeah, it's so we're super young uh, into the beer scene, uh, and our first microbrewery license was issued back in two thousand eight. Uh, 
somewhere in Maharashtra and uh, uh, up north in Haryana. Um, so, uh, but yeah, that, that was the first time when the excise laws were written for microbreweries. Uh, cool. Yeah. And, and you're going to tell me about some uh, unique ingredients you're using uh, in beers in India. Yeah. So we like we don't have some native uh, like specific beer styles, but we okay. uh, we have a lot of local ingredients that we uh, the brewers work with, uh, specifically ingredients like millets. Uh, so millet is like a, a type of cereal grain, uh, which is like really high in fiber, vitamins and minerals. Uh, and it is one of the ancient grains in India. So there are like different types of millets. Uh, so we got foxtail, we got ragi, uh, which is also referred to as finger millet. And we have jor, barnyard, uh, so many, many types. And uh, uh, if you're adding them in, in the raw form, you obviously need to uh, do a perform a serial match to break down those hard starches uh, for the enzymatic conversion during the matching process. Uh, and these are like very formidable, just like the rice, and they can help with achieving greater attenuation. Um, so, uh, and also uh, we are one of the largest consumers of rice. So we have like varieties of rice that we use uh, in, in cooking and also even with uh, making beers, like there are some rice that's like super aromatic uh, we're talking about like Pasmadi rice or Gandakasala rice or Jira Gasamba rice. Some of these are like local varieties. Uh, okay. And uh, these can be incorporated in like flake form, puffed form, or you can just do cereal mash uh, for gel gelatinization. Uh, so, uh, and one great thing about uh, uh, incorporating these ingredients into beers is uh, brewers are. Uh, supporting, like they're giving back to the community, to the local farmers, uh, Absolutely. The that they get from making beer. So that's like pretty awesome, I think. And uh, yeah, the, the, the beer styles, uh, um, like with any of these ingredients, like I said, millets or rice, uh, I think most of the beer styles that I've seen uh, were like probably rice lagers or maybe some kind of like uh, millet saisons, uh, blonde ales, cream ales, like any of those styles uh, you would see uh, these ingredients in. So would you say that the flavor comes through or is there a different on the texture and when you yeah, use, for instance, millet? Millet, uh, it depends on the type of millet and uh, I don't think it contributes to a lot of flavor unless mm -hmm. you add a uh, like, certain amount of it. Uh, but uh, some, sometimes like it can come off as like nutty or earthy okay. uh, and yeah, not not too not too much to an extent where it's like more prominent in any beer style. So awesome. Well, thanks for sharing. We're going to continue introducing uh, the rest of the panel, and we'll all be together uh, chatting a little bit more in a bit. And so now, uh, I I would like to introduce Lucy Corn. And uh, Lucy's an award-winning beer writer and educator. She is the editor of On Tap magazine, founder of Brewmistress, and writes for numeral international publications. Uh, Lucy is joining us from South Africa, and she uh, created the South African National Beer Day uh, over there. And I'll let her uh, speak a little bit more about herself, but welcome, Lucy. Great to have you here. Thank you. It's awesome to be with you guys. Uh, it is uh, three ten in Cape Town awesome. on a Wednesday in December. So I hope I'm not the only panelist who's got a beer on the side. <laughs> I'm certainly I not the only not. person watching. <laughs> Maybe not for you just yet. It's a little early. And um, yeah, I just want to apologize if there's background noise. I'm actually at a at one of my favorite brewery tap rooms at the moment because we have no electricity at home. So if there's noise, it's just it's brewery noise. It's fine. We're, we're happy to have you <laughs> with, with, with or without noise. So what is, uh, and, and I'll ask you to uh, speak about beer in South Africa and also in Africa in general, because it's really something that uh, I have not experienced too much. So uh, please, please share with us. Yeah, we, um, so we, we're sort of the, I don't know, the final frontier, I guess. We, we've got about, um, 160 breweries in South Africa. Across the rest of the continent, there's, there's, you know, each country has got two or three, maybe four maximum. So it's very much um, 
uh, at the beginning of the of the journey. You know, a lot, a lot of the time when people come down here, they say, "Oh, it reminds me of the states in like 1996 or something like that," in terms of beer, at least. Um, but things are, are, are progressing very rapidly. I mean, I'm so I'm originally from the UK, but I've lived here for 12 years, and when I arrived, there were about 15 breweries. And all producing very similar styles, and now we've got yeah around 160. We actually lost a few breweries during the pandemic because um, South Africa had, uh, as well as the lockdowns, we had alcohol bans. Oh, there was, there was certain African countries, um, but we yeah we had alcohol bans for a total of about four months between um, March 2020 and June 2021. So during that time, you know, it just became impossible for some of the smaller guys. So we did we did lose a few breweries uh, in the pandemic, but things are um, are looking up. I think it's it's actually in some ways uh, reinvigorated the industry. People had a lot of downtime to consider how to change their business strategies and that sort of thing. So in some ways, the the pandemic had a positive effect on the South African beer industry for sure. Well, I'm I'm glad it has uh, that positive effect. I think uh, that around the world and uh, for all the panelists feel free to to comment on it but uh, it looks like we're we, we have turned the page right and uh, uh, we've had some uh, difficult moments in uh, in beer before but i think we're ready to uh, get some energy and just keep going uh, to with with the breweries that that are still there and see some growth around the world it's beautiful Lucy, are you still? Whatever? Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I was just having a problem <laughs> unmuting my mic. <laughs> There's a bit of, bit of a delay. Yeah, no, I mean, this year has been great. Hey, we've gone back to having beer festivals again. Um, cool. And yeah, just just life is, is kind of back to normal. And like I say, it's, it's actually in some ways, a lot of people had time to experiment as well and to bring out new beers. Because a, a lot of people, they're bringing out like a new beer every, maybe not every week, but every couple of weeks. Um, a lot of innovation. Um, and yes, we lost some breweries, but uh, the, the, the craft beer scene across Africa is actually really exciting at the moment. Um, it, it used to be very much, it was like everybody did, um, log is a big thing here. I mean, obviously log is a big thing uh -huh. everywhere, but here especially because our industry is young. And it used uh -huh. to be people would do a log or a blonde ale. And then the, everyone had got a vice, everyone had got some kind of a stout or something similar, and then maybe um, like a pale ale. Um, and now we've just, a couple of years ago, so I run the African Beer Cup, which is the only sort of pan-African beer competition. And there was a beer, I can't remember exactly what it was, but I took it out to the, the judges. You know, uh -huh. and you say to them, oh, this is an IPA with whatever, mango and sorghum, blah, blah, blah. And then in my head that I'm like, and it's from Nigeria, which is so exciting. You know, just, cool. it still gives me goosebumps that we've got this yeah. like extreme experimentation going on across the continent. And some, like Nigeria's got like two microbreweries. Okay. Kenya's probably got four or five, you know, but it's just, um, they're, they're taking big strides, you know, cool. to, to, to catch up with the rest of the world. So would, would you say South Africa is the leader uh, of Africa currently? Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, it's, um, I think, culinary culinarily is that a word why is it the same thing um and we've yeah we've got definitely more breweries and i think other countries sort of look to south africa in some ways for for inspiration other african countries also we have um we do grow hops in south africa and um produce malt as well in south africa which some of the other neighboring countries certainly buy from south africa so that kind of helps you know a lot of the african countries don't have the climate for for the raw ingredients. And, and what kind of hop character are you getting out of South African hops? Um, so they, they've been, there's been a lot of experimentation um, and sort of new strains. So it, it very much used to be the hop farms belong to SAB, which now belong to mm -hmm. ABI. Okay. Um, so typically it was all um, bittering hops. But from the 80s, when they could see what was starting to happen in the States, experimentation started with, with newer strains. So now there's a lot more sort of aroma hops and um yeah there's there's um a couple with that nice kind of passion fruit character um okay. yeah there's, there's there's a lot of uh, new stuff coming out 
awesome. That that's great. Uh, that uh, you have local hops and uh, great ingredients to work with. So that's uh, very exciting. So and and tell me a little bit about your uh, writing. Uh, what has your writing experience been, and and uh, what do you like to write about within beer? What I, what I love to write about that I don't get much chance to is like what's going on in other African countries. I do not travel in Africa as much as I would like to. Mm -hmm. um, and it, I, think, I think it's something that people globally are really, um, are really fascinated by because a lot of people have got no idea what's going on, you know, beer-wise across Africa. I was actually in um, Botswana a couple of months ago covering okay. a really cool story up there. So they're also using millet. Um, as in, is, as in is India, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Cool. So, so in in South Africa, we don't. The traditional beer doesn't use millet; it uses sorghum. But in in northern Botswana, they're using millet. And there's this microbrewery that, um, yeah, they started. They started the brewery. It's a very long story, which I won't go into. Uh, little plug: I've written an article about if it could be a hunting that's coming out in January. <laughs> but um, it's just a very cool story around elephant conservation, and. Um, and elephant friendly farming, then they had an excess of millet. So they still basically started a microbrewery because they had millet to use. Um, and they're doing really cool stuff up there, you know, barrel aged sours and such, but with, with millet. Um, so yeah, I think I, I would love one of my goals for next year is to travel a little bit more within Africa and, and cover some of, some of the, the cool stuff that's going on. Awesome, beautiful. Okay, Lucy, I'll... Uh let you go for a minute and I would like to introduce another one of our panelists. Uh, I, I, we have certified sister Taekong Kim from South Korea. Uh, he is the CEO of Amazing Brewing Company and uh, let me know if you can hear me. Hey, AK. Uh, I believe I mean, you're South still muted. Okay. There we go. No, I can hear you now. Uh, all right. So uh, it's 10 p.m. here in South Korea. Uh, and uh, uh, let me introduce myself a little bit. I'm a certified Cicerone and I'm uh, the CEO of Amazing Green Company. I started my brewery back in 2016. Before 2016, I was a home brewer. And uh, I'm also a certified BJCP. So I practice actively still actively participating in uh home brewing competitions here in korea uh, uh, Korea in korea, uh let me give you a little bit of background like uh, 150 craft beer breweries um and uh that uh literally started back in 2015 because that's when we changed the regulation about the microbrewery uh before that there's no literally no uh microbreweries but now uh the volume wise it's about three percent of the total beer volume in korea still uh, 97 percent is a uh, uh, in industrial lager or uh, imported lager uh, and uh, like 80 percent uh domestic lager and 17 percent imported lager market and uh it's really um how can i say it's uh really uh very watery and uh <laughs> doesn't taste like anything uh, a, a, uh korean lager is uh but the culture is fast uh changing really rapidly so uh we're trying really hard uh recently uh a lot of breweries are introducing uh new england ipa and uh, strong, you know, imperial IPAs. But uh, interestingly, uh, during the pandemic, uh, you couldn't really go to pubs and uh, restaurants. So people use the convenience store as their uh, major source for uh, purchasing beer. Okay. And... Uh, Exactly. TK, can you hear me? It looks like 
Oh, okay. It looks like you're back. The parents want them to put a beer in Korea, and they, you know, it tastes like butter because it contains a lot of, you know, diet because we are we are fermenting. Finish our pizza really soon. Then oh, it's really embarrassing. Um, thanks God, it's not. TK, we cannot hear. Here, but um, it, it, it. okay. And TK looks like it lost the connection, so we're going to move into the next panelist. And Noel uh, is from Panama. Uh, he is a certified Cicerone, a Domen's Amec Beer Sommelier an international beer judge with 40 plus beer competitions in America, Europe, and Africa. He is a beer specialist from Universidad de Alicante and KU Lubin, and an independent beer consultant. Uh, welcome, Noel. Um, thank you, Shima. It's uh, so good to see you again. Uh, yeah, definitely. Invitation. Well, right now I'm living in Paris, but yeah, I, I'm in Panama here, it's 8 a.m. So instead of a beer, I'm having a good coffee, as you can see. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> so, and uh, well, if you can please explain, uh, right? You're uh, from Panama, but you're you've been in Paris for how long? Uh, I've been there uh, for eleven months now. But uh, mm -hmm. um, my wife and I, I'm, I'm, I'm we're supposed to stay for at least two years. Awesome, awesome. Mm -hmm. So. Tell me a little bit about uh, the culture of beer, both in Panama and Paris, and how it has been like to to move uh, between those two countries and and look at it from the beer perspective. Well, Panama is uh, well, we're neighbors since you're in Costa Rica. Panama is a small four million people country, but very multicultural, cosmopolitan, with a strong dynamic uh, commercial nature, thanks to the Panama Canal. It is like a strategic hub that not only unites uh, two oceans, the Caribbean and the, uh, the Pacific, but millions of people that passes by every day, cultures, opportunities, influences. So having a historical American influence, it was natural to have a strong craft beer uh, industry. Um, and in terms of, of uh, breweries and, and, and styles, etc., I mean, we have two macro breweries, uh, you have Cerveceria Nacional, which is part of AB InBev, and you have Cerveceria del Baru, which is the, the other one, that it's Heineken. Uh, those behemoths represent uh, 90 plus percent of the, of the market as, as in many countries. Uh, then you have imports for, for the US, Mexico, Europe, etc. They're very strong here uh, for what I said before about our commercial nature as a country. Uh, then you have uh, let's say 20 formal le legally established <laughs> locally independent breweries, uh, around 10 contract brewing brands with regular production. And uh, so let's say we have 30 brands uh, sharing the local craft beer market in Panama, four of them being the leaders and trendsetters in the, in the micro in the craft beer industry. Then you have hundreds of home brewers, some of them really good selling, <laughs> selling their beers here and there, you know, like in anywhere else, and uh, yeah, it's 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 quite booming. It's it's growing. We had um, as as in South Africa, we had a dry law for four months as well, and uh, it was a very very draconian decision from the government. Uh, in some point, we we were more scared of the government than from the COVID itself. But at the end, we're bouncing back. You know, uh, we're very very lucky to and very. Uh, strong in that sense, we're very resilient to, to, to come back stronger and that's what's happening. Uh, brewers are, are st starting to create new things, so we're, we're doing good right now. Awesome. I'm very happy to hear that and, and yeah, it's interesting how around the world there was a different laws it, that affected beer uh, along uh, with the pandemic, so, so that's very interesting and and once again, I'm glad that that, that that's over because I, I feel like uh, 
there wasn't a, a direct connection between COVID and, and beer to justify a, a restriction of any kind. So I'm glad I'm glad we're back, and I don't think anybody has a, a, any current restrictions that I know of a, as of today. Um, so that's good. But anyways, thanks everyone for joining. Now we're ready uh, to see all of us. Uh, that that was the the individual uh, introduction. So it's it's great to see all of the faces now uh, all together. Um, and and I'll share um one of my experiences from Costa Rica, and and that will segue to to one of my first questions. So uh, it's very interesting um, that in Costa Rica, one of the things that uh, pushed what we have on the shelf in supermarkets was the uh, ambassador from Belgium. So actually, uh, this uh, person who was ambassador from Belgium decided to import beer as well. And then shifted our supermarkets from having um, just maybe local beer or just lagers to have... Uh, several imports from Belgium, and uh, we actually have this person uh, to think, at least at the start, it has like varied a little bit more, but it's interesting how like a single person um, can shape uh, what we get uh, in, in our different countries. So my question would be like, let, let's talk about Belgian beers and um, can you get Belgian beers in your countries? And, or also, do you have a similar story of a, a single person or brewery that has shaped um, kind of like the, the beer variety uh, in your countries? And anybody, feel free to, to jump in and join. Well, in the case of... Okay, <laughs> Okay, no, I was just going to say that, uh, so we also, um, Belgian imports for us were pr probably the the first non, like, big lager beers that we were getting in South Africa. Um, there's a restaurant in Cape Town called Den Anker, and they were bringing in Belgian beers. The, re the restaurant's been going probably 25 years, um, so long before um, craft beer was certainly a thing in South Africa. Um, so that, that certainly, I think, started um, getting people interested in, in different kinds of beers, which they then sort of, you know, became homebrewers, which is often the way that these things sort of start. We also, I think one of, um, it's one of our older brands, they actually started as a contract brand, um, Jack Black, it's called. They started in 2007. They actually just had their 15th birthday party last weekend. Um, and they they'd been working in the states so a husband and wife team and they'd been living and working in the states and started getting interested in craft beer and they started a, a lager brand uh, which has since you know it was a contract brand and it's since become quite a large brewery and um they've got a you know range of different beers uh vice beer a couple of pale ales a couple of ipas um and i think they were they were really very very important they made uh craft beer sort of hip and they, they you know they went to the, the cool markets on weekends so they were a big player. And we did have another importer actually that was bringing in um, uh, German style beers. There was also, it was like an uber hip brand. And so, you know, the cool people were drinking this beer and then everybody else wanted to drink it because the hipsters were drinking it. So that's kind of how it started here for us. That's great. And I believe Noel had uh, something to share too uh, around those lines. Uh, well, in, 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 in Panama, we had... Uh, uh, a strong uh, uh, Belgian beer importer called LB Bieren, which uh, were pioneers in, in some uh, beer styles, let's say uh, risky styles like Lambic and Goose and Nautbrun and Flanders Red, all, all those styles, which were very, very strange for the common, you know, for the, for the normal beer market, let's say. Uh, they were the first to, to introduce them to, to the country. And they were very strong. So it, it, they're they're very small, but still they're very um, familiar with the with Belgian culture. Uh, so uh, it, it became a very popular place in Panama, uh, where many people from from the whole world started coming to visit their showroom just to 
to to see that strange experience to being in a tropical Central American country, having this this whole uh, selection, uh, very good selection of of of, of particular exquisite. Uh, beer styles, and then they have uh, all uh, you know from monastic styles to to uh, to any modern Belgian uh, beer styles as well. Uh, but they were very very important in the in the in the Belgian influence in Panama. Let's say nowadays we 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 find a lot of other Im importers that are bringing some other brands, some other styles. And obviously, uh, in parallel, we have uh, the local craft beer industry getting uh, much better every day. So now they have to compete with the local uh, breweries as well, because you will find a lot of, of, of good Belgian styles made in Panama. So, so it is a, a, a really uh, curious uh, evolution of things in, in, in our small uh, community and industry in beer. That's great. And uh, what about in India? And do you, would do you, can you get Belgian beers, or is it, um, it is there another influence from UK or American? What what would you say shapes uh, more uh, the the beer selection in India right now? It really depends on the tax laws uh, that you have in different states. Uh, okay. And if you look at Karnataka, the state I'm living in right now. Uh, they have a huge import tax. Uh, so I heard there were beers uh, like uh, some of the Trappist beers and Dual and until recently we had Le Blanc and some of the German beers, uh, but they eventually dropped out because uh, I think it was like in the last decade, uh, we didn't have much. So it was like back in 2000s. Uh, but I also think the, the beer culture was not like really established back then and then uh, not many people were aware of what these beers are. And uh, so they were like lying in the sh warm shelves for years and years and until they expired. And, you know, so I think that's one of the reasons. And also like with all these huge import taxes, like you're going to end up paying a bomb for that beer, uh, which is like pretty old, you know? So, right. um, so that was quite, quite a, quite a bit of a challenge we had. And still to this day, uh, we, we do get some imports like from time to time, uh, may not be specifically in Karnataka, but uh, if you look at Delhi or Gurgaon, like up north, uh, and even in Mumbai, they get some kind of uh, imports uh, from UK, some some bitters and, uh, and, and recently in Bangalore, I've seen Cooper's Pale Ale and Cooper's uh, Stout, the foreign extra stout. So, which I think it's pretty cool, but I think we still have challenges with the cold chain uh, and storage in, transport so you know it's not like it's it's the it's a hit and a miss um so yeah absolutely and uh, thanks uh, anything to add tk for that question me can you hear me yes i can hear now okay uh yeah i think it's the it's pretty much the same situation here in korea too uh we it's it's very uh bipolarizing market here in Korea. So there are uh, like super enthusiastic customer who really you know uh, uh, looking for Belgian beer and sour beer or uh, barrel aged imperial stout kind of uh, you know beer. But I think I think uh, it feels like the market is not really expanding. You see the same faces when wherever you go, uh, whenever there's a you know drinking event. So those people uh, are the same people, uh, and it's not really spreading out um, outside of the uh, you know beer geek boundaries. So it's a kind of frustrating, but uh, yeah, we should keep trying. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it's funny you mentioned that. I've also seen uh, some trends uh, around Latin America that uh, there maybe is a nice group of uh, breweries that forms and, and along with home brewers and uh, but then like there's a kind of like a plateau right and and then well i i guess we had the pandemic that it's something that it's hard to uh, quantify even now like what the real effect was and um, in breweries but and um, we haven't seen a uh, kind of like the uh, 
exponential expansion that that happened in the U.S. and in that many other countries. So uh, it is interesting to understand like the markets and understand that that there is growth. And so I'll I'll ask you and and anybody feel to join in. What what is uh, when did the growth happen? Uh, I know we had here in Costa Rica a, a good amount of growth, like in 2013. Uh, what was a boom here in Costa Rica. So what year would you consider uh, the one that created that like biggest growth in your countries? Uh, let me go first. Uh, we had a pretty big uh, quantum jump back in 2016 when the mm -hmm. regulation has changed. Uh, firstly, there was a, a collaboration beer between Mikeller and a local brewery. And it, it was a it was a big hit, such a big hit. So, so every every Ooh. retailer, every restaurant wanted that beer, but it was kind of one of thing. Uh, it slowly faded it out, and but actually it it, it uh, inflated market. So it's uh, the market size was uh, was uh, bigger than before, but mm -hmm. then it didn't you know grow exponentially. But again, in 2020, when pandemic happened, one of the uh, convenience store chain introduced a uh, uh, Vizen. It's a quasi Vizen beer, something like uh, 1664 Blanc. Okay. Uh, it's a artificial kind of, you know, grew the market. So it's not like a linear growth. It's more like, a, what can I say, like, uh, or here in Korea. All right, and it's cool that you that you mentioned that 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 there were transition beers. So that that's something also we can uh, talk about. That uh, there are some beers that uh, are for the general public, but also help introduce uh, more beer and uh, more beer styles and more flavors to the public. So, uh, who else has something to share about that? I think, uh, like for for us uh, in India, uh, I've seen like there was a gradual growth in the beginning of uh, uh, the 2010s, uh, and and I think right at like 2017, 2018, we saw a rise of uh, craft beer, craft breweries, and uh, the pandemic has changed a lot of things. Uh, some of it in a good way, where like some you it, some of these. Policies to change it usually takes years and years, but that accelerated during pandemic. Like, uh, like you look at Maharashtra, uh, they implemented a permanent uh, policy to distribute uh, beers in microbreweries in forms of like crawlers, kegs, and uh, that wasn't the case uh, before pandemic. Um, so after pandemic, there like every microbrewery can deliver beer, um, and uh, they can like packaged beers in, in the crawlers and growlers. Um, so uh, even in Bangalore, we had the same situation, but they repealed it after the pandemic was over, kind of like in 2021. So uh, yeah, that has impacted a lot. Uh, and uh, like usually in Karnataka, we're not allowed to, like none of the microbreweries are allowed to distribute beers. So it's, so they don't have like a chance of expansion to into different like sending beers and kegs to different bars, uh, they can't do that and they can't bottle it unless you have a commercial license. So okay. it's it's kind of like tricky situation. Yeah. yeah, that that's that's still very restrictive, but it looks like that that new law after the pandemic will will help a little, uh, right? To keep a uh, expansion going. And uh, Lucy, you had you wanted to share about Umquam Boti uh, as well, right? So pl please tell me if I pronounced that right, and 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 please say it correctly. <laughs> I, um, I I can't always get it quite right myself. The the cue is a click, so it's uh, it's along the lines of Umquam Boti. No, I didn't get quite right. Hang on, Umquam Boti. So the cue is a click. Um, yeah. So this is traditional. Um, African beer, sub-Saharan African beer, um, particularly traditional in in in, so, in South Africa and surrounding countries, in Zimbabwe in particular. Uh, so it's sorghum based. Um, it's got sorghum and maize, 
there's no uh, multiboli, there's no hops. This is like beer from the hieroglyphics kind of thing. As you can see, this is this is a homebrew batch that I did, um, but it's it's thick. Um, it's not. It's it's very the watering process very rudimentary, just like with a, a sieve. It's low alcohol, and this is during the, the fermentation. It's like three percent ABV, something like that. Served very served while still um, while still actively fermenting. So very very young. You know, it's brewed on Monday, served on Saturday, sort of thing, uncarbonated. Um, so it's it's quite an unusual beer. I, I actually I did a talk at HomebrewCon this year in Pittsburgh, and I, I found a local homebrewer and we brewed a batch together to have for tasting. And it was it was the talk of the what you know like people were talking about it all day. Whether they liked it or not was a different thing. You know, people were, but everybody was talking about this beer because it was so unlike other thing. I think the closest thing I could compare it to is probably Chicha in, right. in Latin America. You know, it's the same kind of ballpark. But what's really interesting about it is, you see, for a long time here in South Africa, people originally, they, everyone was doing sort of German styles. Mm -hmm. And then people very much copy whatever's going on in the States, of course, because that's where a lot of trends are emerging, you know, same for everybody. So we have lots of uh, for New England IPAs, um, lots of different versions. You know, Brewed IPA was a big thing a couple of years ago. The Black IPA was a big thing. We even had one or two glitter beers. Um, but recently i think south african microbrewers are trying to um develop something that's that's you know with with more of an african heritage to it so awesome. while the, this the, the the traditional beer is a bit of a tough sell you know it's it's so unlike beer as we think of it but it's being used as inspiration so there's a brewery here in cape town called ukamba ukamba is the the name of the drinking vessel so it's like it's a communal um, drinking vessel cool. and so his brewery he's from zimbabwe his brewery is called ukamba and he uses sorghum in his beers you know so it's inspired by the beer that he grew up with his um his grandmother making it's um still traditionally brewed by women um and there's quite a few people who are experimenting in the african beer cup we have quite a lot of beers using like our alternative grain category is disproportionately large i think compared to other competitions because around Absolutely. africa there are people using sorghum millets and uh, fonio which is a west african grain so yeah it's a I, I would love to be able to pass this to you through the screen so you can taste it <laughs> <laughs> me too i would love to uh, taste those as well and and i'm looking forward to uh, africa shaping beer styles in the future right so like, i think that 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 is going to be very interesting once it makes the transition and um, for the people watching usually bjcp uh, regulates like beer styles and, and it's an organization that uh, organizes beers into beer styles and um, there's some experimental styles uh, that make it to that category and uh, so usually they provide guidelines for judging and then in the future uh, if the beer reaches popularity or becomes like i don't know an international beer and uh, it it makes it to like a form of beer style so uh, it's very interesting to see how uh, that is shaping i know that yeah this uh, is the, this is the ultimate goal for us in south africa is to, mm -hmm. is to get a beer into the bjcp guidelines and we do we're looking at it for the african beer cup to have our yeah. own guideline for that category in the in the meantime until such a time comes you know because we Perfect. need to represent what's happening in Africa. I, I think that's awesome and, and thanks for sharing that. Some cool things that we're doing in Costa Rica is a uh, trying to find our local wild yeasts. And uh, so some brewers are uh, searching uh, in fruits and fruit peels uh, for different uh, flavors that, uh, I'm sorry, different yeast strains that grow uh, naturally. So what they're doing is uh, they're uh, picking fruit randomly and then uh, letting it uh, ferment with some wort and, and then taking it to the lab uh, to see exactly what's growing there and to see if we can get like some native uh, yeast strains uh, here from Costa Rica. And, and some have been successful. So I think that's, that's very exciting because uh, when we think about local ingredients, uh, we think a lot about like fruit and as as we mentioned in Africa, grains, uh, but yeast can also uh, put a, a different uh, flaring beer. And um, 
I want to also move into a, the local cuisine and, and the food. So what kind of like a beer pairing with a local food do you guys have on each of your countries? So we have a lot of local food varieties uh, and like there are like endless possibilities in, in combining Indian cuisine uh, with uh, beers uh, in a way where like we are abundant in spices. So we have a lot of spices and different cuisines incorporate different blend of spices. So um, something like uh, like in, in Bangalore, like Donai Biryani is something that's like very popular. So this dish, it's a, it's a rice dish uh, and it's it's made with a blend of spices and it can have like, there could be like chicken or mutton uh, as, as a meat option uh, in it. And then they're like, like different like cinnamon, uh, star anise, uh, bay leaves, and, and uh, it's made with uh, coriander, freshly cracked coriander and uh, mint leaves. Um, and uh, it's accompanied with some raita that has, that's like a yogurt based sauce with some raw onions and um, cilantro on top of it. So, um, so this, when, when you're talking about this dish, uh, there, like I can probably think of something like a Belgian Saison or like a Belgian Blondale, um, uh, probably like even a Weiss beer or Weizenbach at like 7% ABV. So there's like a lot of complement with the, um, with the uh, spices and uh, the carbonation is really, really good enough to like uh, cut through the meat and uh, um, a lot of like compliments from cilantro uh, uh, to the, uh, the fermentation character from your Weiss beer and uh, the phenolics um, from like, like flow or pepper from some of these uh, like saisons or uh, Belgian Blonde. Um, so, and there's also like, there, there are many items, uh, but I think there's like, even if you're looking at dessert, uh, like we have, uh, something that's really special called the Mysore Pak. Uh, so this is like a local, uh, dessert that's quite famous here in Karnataka. So, uh, I can, so this is like, uh, uh, it, it's sugar, sugar based, uh, like there's like gram flour, sugar and uh, ghee, which is like a clarified butter. Um, so that has some kind of that caramelized texture because of uh, eating the sugar. And um, you can probably think of like pairing that with um, anything like a, uh, like a Belgian double or dark strong ale to really match up with that Mayan character. And also the dried fruit flavors in a double can really be act like a topping uh, on, on, this, on this desert. Uh, and uh, um, so yeah, then the carbonation can really drive off the, the sweetness. So I think there are like many possibilities, like even with the appetizers, bar snacks, we have masala peanuts, which can really go with uh, like some of these light, crispy, easy drinking lagers and um, the Belgian wheat beers uh, and uh, Hefeweizen. So uh, yeah, there, there are like many, many possibilities that you can like do uh, in a microbrewery when you have uh, feed and food and beer together. That that sounds delicious. I I don't think we have here in Costa Rica, an Indian food restaurant that offers a wide selection of beer. So I'm going to have next time I go in there, I'll I, I might bring some of those beer suggestions and, and or, or just ask for take home and do my pairings here. And what, what else that do we have in terms of a food and beer pairing around the world? Thank you, Anadi. Go ahead, um, Noah. Um. Some, some styles that have, have, have a strong connection with, with Panama are fruited sour beers or spiced sour beers, uh, because we're very used to, to eat a lot of sour fruits uh, since we're very young, you know, um, liche, guava, dark cherries, tamarind, green currants, passion fruit. Uh, uh, we have so many uh, fruits and spices to play with beer. So, uh, I would say uh, fruited sour beers are one of the, even though uh, we're very Americanized and we have IPAs and everything, I think I think sour beers have uh, had a huge impact in, in, our, in our market. So one of the pairings that I, with local dishes in, in Panama that I, that I really like is, uh, since seafood is really good around here, you know, for our proximity to both oceans, uh, one of my favorite pairings is a local Caribbean dish called guacho de marisco. Uh, that it's some sort of uh, risotto with a with a bit more broth, you know. 
So it's, it's normally served with some other dish called Platano and Tentacion, which is a ripe plantain caramelized uh, with brown sugar and cinnamon. And then you have as a side uh, lettuce salad with dried cranberries, let's say. So I love to pair this dish with a goza with lemon kaffir leaves. Uh, since it's very common to, to add lemon to, to seafood, uh, the sour lemony character of the beer does the work well when it plays with the dish. Uh, then you have an awesome sweet and sour contrast uh, uh, with the caramelized uh, plantain. And finally, you have uh, uh, some sort of subtle vinegar to the, to the salad. And finally, the CO2 and the dry finish of the beer sweeps away everything from your palate and leaving you wanting more. It's a very, very good uh, pairing for me. You know, it's uh, one of my personal favorite local dishes and, and pairing beer pairings here in Panama. Awesome, awesome. Uh, TK, it, I, I love uh, Korean cuisine. Uh, what, what kind of... Uh, experiments have you done with beer and food over there uh unfortunately uh korean food are very spicy and mm -hmm. we use a lot of garlic sure. and peppers in in korean cuisine so so people tend to use beer uh to you know uh wash, wash their mouth <laughs> um, wash their mm -hmm. palates so sure. that, i think that's one of the reasons why the the industrial lager is so dominant in this market but uh, craft beer drinkers uh, recently uh, like to pair their beer with uh, fried chicken and um, pizza. It's it's a it's a it's a very uh, Western influenced kind of culture. But uh, chicken and pizza are the two most uh, kind of uh, thing that w whenever you uh, go to a craft beer pub. They usually serve very good pizza or very good uh, fried chicken, uh, but uh, it's not like a KFC or or, or, or you know American franchise uh, chicken. They are very creative about the sauce and uh, the the dressing of the chicken. So there are like soy chicken, there's a pepper chicken, there's a Chinese pepper chicken. There's kind of you know uh, fried chickens, uh, so I, I think uh, they they are not very creative about the um, the wide range of the the ingredient, but they are more creative about uh, the sauce or the the the, the, the dressing of the of the fried chicken, and they match uh, with the with the beer they're drinking. Yeah, and and that's a great point that. When you're doing a beer pairing, a lot of the times the sauce is the key uh, element to pair with, right? And and you could have a uh, ten different sauces uh, for fried chicken and and do a, a full fried chicken dinner uh, and and pairing just just based on the same food but with different sauces. So that's uh, I, I've experienced uh, the same thing. And oh my God, fried fried food and, and just hearty food is great uh, with, with to have with beers. We have in Costa Rica a, a local dish called chifrijo, and chifrijo has a uh, pork rinds uh, as the meat uh, on top of uh, rice beans, and and we usually use a, the larger bean variety. Uh, we call it cubases mm. uh, in Spanish. And we add to that pico de gallo, which is a, a mix of tomatoes and onions and uh, cilantro and, and definitely lots of lime. So it's a, it, it's a bowl. It, you eat it in a bowl and, and it's delicious. And, and definitely um, those kinds of foods, I, I, I actually enjoy it a lot with, with IPAs, with, with a local IPA. And, but... It, it's it's great uh, to see how we can mix uh, beers with with local cuisine. Uh, Lucy, did you have anything to share in this topic? Lucy, I think you muted yourself again. There you go. Okay. <laughs> yeah, this, this conversation's made me really hungry. Um, 
Yeah, so South Africa is a very, so we've, we've got very varied cuisine actually, uh, big seafoods, um, you know, because obviously we're, we've, we've also got two oceans, um, very, very sweet desserts. We're big meat eaters, very big meat eaters. And the thing that brings sort of, you know, all the different um, cultures of South Africa together is the braai, which is a barbecue cooked over over wood usually or over coals, not over gas. And um, the, I, for me, those like those caramelized flavors work really well with some of the English, you know, the caramelized flavors in English bitters. Unfortunately, we have no English imports in South Africa anymore. And very, very few people make English beer styles. They're just... There is this idea that English beer is flat and warm, and this just doesn't it just doesn't sell well in South Africa. But I do want to give a shout out to Biltong. This is it's similar to beef jerky, but way, <laughs> way better than beef jerky. It's like it's 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 really nicely salted, nice kind of, of beef and uh, with coriander seed um, and other spices. And it is the <laughs> best hangover food in the world. So the best pairing is Biltong and whatever your hair of the dog beer is. Every time I travel, well, actually, every time I have a hangover and I have some Biltong, I feel sad for everybody in the world who doesn't have any. Because how do you how do you deal with your hangovers? So that's my favorite pairing. That sounds Africa. delicious. <laughs> and now that I have you here, uh, we have a, a user that sent the question, Matthew Kaiser. What alternative exists in your countries to brew gluten-free beer options, specifically in South Africa? Yes, yeah, so, I mean the traditional beers are the, um, sorghum is the is the main grain that was used in, in traditional beers. And then millet also in Africa. And I know in West Africa there's a grain called Fonio. I don't know much about it, but I think also gluten free. What we don't really have is much of a gluten-free beer uh, scene industry across the continent. Um, there's been one two in South Africa that used mostly sorghum. Sorghum is very difficult to eat Lizzie. by itself. You, you're it's 100%. you're cutting up a little bit, and yeah. so I'll 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 try to repeat what what I got uh, yes. from you. Nice. And that sorghum it would be like the, the most used um, a grain. Um, to you, as a so. Few people this brewery Lucy, you're you're, cu you're cutting up quite a bit. <laughs> they are uh, experimenting with different percentages of millets. And All right, so I had another Just question uh, for for TK. And so, TK, tell me a little bit more about butter beer and and what that means in uh, South Korea. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, it was created by a small brewery, uh, but the uh, the idea is from a from a a, a singer, a, ce a celebrity. So it's not from a beer person, and this singer is quite famous in Korea, and he. Uh, I think he got the idea from Harry Potter, you know, uh, uh, novel because uh, in Harry Potter novel uh, they mention about butter beer, uh, and it's actually originally it's for kids, but he kind of translated that idea into diacetyl beer because he he found out that there's a there's a diacetyl, you know, uh, if there's a diacetyl, it, it it you know smells and tastes like butter. And he found it very interesting, and he introduced the concept to the market, and the retailers accepted it, and now it's the best-selling beer in Korea. So all the Cicerones and all the BJCP in Korea, they they feel very embarrassed when, whenever we we see this poster in the convenience store, 
but uh it's a it's a marketing thing you know so people you know normal people don't know anything about diacetyl or whatever of flavor so they say oh it it's it's instagrammable because the design is so nice blah 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 so it's kind of sad uh, but it's it, yeah it's happening <laughs> well I I don't think it's sad. Like I, I mean, there, there's been a history of beers around the world with a, what we normally consider off flavors. So, uh, for the general audience uh, listening that that might not know what diacetyl is, is uh, usually um, considered a flaw in beer. Uh, but it depends also on the beer style because, uh, for instance, uh, on Czech lagers like Pilsen and Urkel, uh, there's um, some detectable levels of the settle and that, that's perfectly fine and it complements the style. Um, so I think it, there's uh, nothing to be ashamed of and uh, if people like it, I think that that's something that... Um, it's, it's just one more thing that makes a, a South Korea unique uh, in, in the beer world, right? So, uh, but thanks for thanks for sharing that. That was a, a, a great story. And um, so we're uh, done with the hour. So I don't know if anybody had uh, some finishing remarks before uh, we end the transmission. All right. In that case, I would like to thank everybody, uh, the audience that uh, was able uh, to log in live from all parts of the world. Thanks for waking up early, for staying late for this. And thanks to all our panelists. You really uh, made this great. And I honestly uh, consider that today I learned about beer uh, uh, of the different world and food and and I want to visit each one of you in in your countries and try some of those beers and, and food pairings it was absolutely amazing so uh, thanks so much for joining bye thanks, have a great one thank you